As you may or may not know, we took a small team to Ireland uh, the last two weeks, and it was a ministry trip really designed. Uh, the heart of it was to solidify some significant connections we have over there with some worship things that are happening. Uh, also connect with a couple churches, uh, some new connections there so we can start to share ministry together. And, uh, and it, was, it was a great trip. I mean, it really was. We had the first weekend, we had a chance to be in Belfast, sharing at a church there that if you know some of the history of Ireland, there's a lot of tension. Uh, most of that tension erupted between Catholics and Protestants, and Belfast is really in the center of that. Uh, if you do some history in the 1970s especially, but, but that tension has subsided, but it's not gone yet. Um, as a matter of fact, Belfast was such a, uh, a war-torn area that they developed a gate, basically went right through the center of the city, and uh, on one side of that gate is the Protestant side, one was a Catholic side, and they would lock those gates at 9 p.m. so that people couldn't drive riot trucks through and cause chaos. The church we had the privilege of visiting sits between the gates, and if you came in one side, you'd be coming in the Protestant side. If you came in the other side of the gates to get to church, you'd be coming in the Catholic side. This church exists on the margins, reaching people who've been separated by hatred and religion, by addiction. The suicide rate is so high in Belfast. The alcoholism rate is so high. The chance to go in and just share with the church that is so much like us, it was just like being a family. It was a great experience. We were walking around Ireland one day, down near city center, and, and um, it was on Monday morning, on Sunday night, I had just uh, shared my second message at this church about the power of our words, uh, the ability that God gives us to speak blessing, that one thing we've chosen to do with the sanctuary church is be people of blessing. We don't walk around and curse our city, we speak light into it. We believe light overcomes darkness. We don't have to be perpetuators of hate in order to drive hate out. And so that was kind of part of the word. But anyway, we're uh, walking around Monday, inner city, and, and as we were going in front of the parliament building in Belfast, uh, there was a couple guys out there with a little PA system, and, and they were uh, street preachers and just telling uh, as loud as that PA would go how angry God is at Belfast and how his judgment is coming and the wrath is coming because of all the sin and brokenness and and that's why the suicide rate's so high and the alcoholism rate's so high because God is pouring out his wrath on this city. And it grieved me as I walked by, but it also pissed me off. <laughs> and, and as I walked by, I just, you know, we were heading somewhere else and I just kind of under my voice, I just kind of was like, you guys suck. <laughs> I mean, literally, I just, I don't, I, come on, have you ever been around those kind of preachers? Right? And I feel like all the good work like this church is doing gets, can get just washed away by this toxic hatred, you know. And, and, you know, and again, we, we talk so much here about this. People already have this overarching sense that God is mad at them. And then we're just going to go continue to uh, perpetuate that lie. So as I walked by, I just said, I wish you guys would shut up. And I said it to myself, not to them. But, um, and I walked by. And we got a few blocks later, and something inside of me just was feeling really convicted. And when I slowed down enough to listen, I just felt Holy Spirit say to me, you know, do you not feel the need to walk in what you preached? And I'm like, uh... And I realized, you know, I, I had been talking the night prior about speaking blessing, and I just walked by those guys and cursed them. And so Cindy and I went back to these well-intentioned street preachers and walked up to them and um, basically engaged with them to hear their story. And this one guy, um, at that point, they weren't preaching because they were actually sharing the gospel with a couple people. Um, but, you know, we talked to this one guy, and, and he had talked about how he was in recovery and God met him in that place and basically scared the hell out of him. And he got sober and was uh, now just wanting to proclaim the message of Jesus to people and was being mentored by this other guy. But, 
Um, it had cost him his relationship with his family because now he was a Christian and and uh, he was just really trying to do his best. And so we uh, invited him to think about the gospel in another way, about a gospel of peace, a gospel of love, that the message of the cross was as much about our value as it was our sin. And you could just see God just lighten him up. And then we, then we prayed for him. We prayed blessing over his life. Cindy prayed reconciliation with his brother. We prayed just God's goodness all over him. And I realized, like, what if we would have just walked away by cursing? What would have been the fruit of that in his life? But see, this is, you know, I understand where he's coming from. And if you've been around and kind of raised in church or conservative evangelicalism, you kind of get this because, you know, there was a season in my life that, um, you know, I go to church and I, I, I kind of had this sense that they were trying to scare the hell out of me. And, and a lot of that came from like this passage in um, Deuteronomy 28. Part of the problem is we read the Bible. It is the authoritative word of God, but we read it flat, which means that it all has equal weight from the Old Testament to the New. And we don't understand that it's a narrative. It's God's story of redemption. And the, the Old Testament in your Bible before Jesus is really a people in search of understanding this God that they know. And the New Testament is people learning how to live out the God they've met in Jesus Christ. I mean, go like this if you're with me here. Go like that if I went right over your head. All right. So, so we we take we take passages like Deuteronomy 28, and they're pretty intense. Uh, this is really in Deuteronomy 28 verse 15. It's really it's even titled in my Bible, and it may be in yours, "Curses on Disobedience." How many of you have ever been disobedient? How many of you were disobedient last night? I'm just seeing my daughter raised her hand. Where was she? Okay. All right. She was out with a bunch of our 20-somethings. Okay, anyway. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I have commanded you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. That alone should make you shiver a little bit. But then, God unloads the curses. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall you be your basket in your kneading bowl. Those are the things that people did for production and to feed their families. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body that produces the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. It's like life sucks at this point. Verse 20, the Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke and all that you set your hand to until you're destroyed, until you perish quickly. Um, verse 21, the Lord will make a plague cling to you. Verse 22, the Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation. Verse 23, and your heavens which are over you shall be like bronze. Basically like, God, even when I talk to you, I can't, it doesn't go anywhere. You ever feel like your just prayers are bouncing off the ceiling? Verse 25, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. Even when you try to make a stand for what is good, or some of us, the enemy is a chemical or, or a, you know, a substance or a relationship, and, and it just keeps overtaking us. Verse 28, the Lord will strike you with madness or confusion and blindness and of your heart. Verse 30, you'll betroth the wife and another man will lie with her. Well, that's good news. That's just the bachelor. But um, <laughs> You shall build a house. You won't dwell in it. Verse 31, your ox will be slaughtered before your eyes. You shall not eat of it. Your donkey shall be violently taken from you. Some of you are going, shoo, I don't have an ox or donkey. Let me just put it this way for you. No matter how hard you try to save your own ass, you won't be able to. <laughs> There's a point here. You can go on and on and on in Deuteronomy 28. The point is this. It all centers on disobedience. Or, really, it all centers on obedience. If you are not obedient 
to what God has asked, these things are going to overtake you in your life. So how good do you have to be in order to not live under a curse? How righteous do you need to be in order not to have these things overtake your life? There's probably not one person in this room that would qualify to be good enough to not live under this. So why do we use it so often to scare people, to get them to behave correctly? Because I have good news for you today. I mean, it's tremendous news if you find yourself stuck in some of these curses. Confusion in your heart, broken relationships, addiction, oppression, depression, plagues in your body. All these things that are listed there as, as just curses of broken humanity. That there's a promise that, that is laid out that this is pointing towards. At that point in history, there wasn't a cross. And so this was pointing towards something. That you and I will never be good enough to get out from underneath a curse. You'll never make it. But there's good news for saints and sinners and losers and winners, and those who are abused and abusers and whores and gamblers and lost people and fearful people and ADH people. There's good news for people who are suffering with addictions or cutting or tweaking or pierced and tatted. There's good news because of the cross. The cross. The amazing cross of Jesus. If you don't believe me, let's stay biblical. Galatians 3.13 says this. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. See, there was a point in history that if you weren't even born Jewish, you had no chance. You couldn't receive the blessings God had. And yet, Galatians, Paul tells us here that it was at the cross that all these curses were broken. Even for you and I, who weren't born into the Jewish family, You get included and grafted into the the family of God. There's promises in Deuteronomy 28 that exist as well. There's promises of obedience. Those promises are beautiful. In verse 2 of Deuteronomy 28, it says, And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. Do you realize that when you get under the shadow of the cross, see, we, sometimes people say, you know, you guys preach Jesus like way too much. How come you don't do really cool topical things like, you know, how to, how to make money or, um, you know, s- 10 ways to leave your lover or whatever? Because uh, we're not doing pop psychology here. We have all realized that the only chance we have in life comes through Jesus Christ himself. We don't, it's just... And so these things begin to overtake you. When you are in the shadow of the cross, when you begin to realize on the front side of the cross, all those curses came. And on the back side of the resurrection, all the blessings became ours. It is the, the, I just become more and more enamored with understanding the significance of what happened when Jesus died and was resurrected. These things begin to overtake us. Look at this. Blessed shall you be in the city, verse 3. And blessed shall you be in the country. That points to Jesus. He loved country music. <laughs> it point, I, mean, I still have jet lag today. I don't know. It, listen. It was in the city of Jerusalem that Jesus was whipped and cursed and spat upon. And it was in the countryside of Jerusalem, on Golgotha, that he was pierced for our transgressions. You shall be blessed in the city and in the country because Jesus covered all geography. 
You'll be blessed with the fruit of your body, the produce of the ground, your basket and your kneading bowl. You'll be blessed when you come in. You'll be blessed when you go out. You see, if you are willing to accept that the curse was broken at the cross, then you and I need to be willing to accept that the favor comes from the cross. Right? If Jesus paid for it, he paid for it. Don't take one without the other. Don't, oh God, thank you so much. I got my little ticket to heaven. I'm not going to burn in hell. I'm, I'm, you know, you've set me free. But there's more to just being set free than not having problems in your life. There's walking and blessing in your life. There's walking with peace in your life. You move from having confusion to wisdom in your life. You move from having discontentment and, and depression to actually having hope and peace in your life. Do you get what I'm saying? There's blessing that comes with what Jesus did as well. Because greater is he who is in you than he's in the world. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive in you also. If you like the things you saw in Jesus... They're in you now. That's pretty good news. If you, if you like the compassion that was in Jesus, the way he just embraced people, regardless of their race or their sin or their background or their poverty level, if you like that, it's in you also. You can be that kind of compassionate person. If you like the power that Jesus walked in and words of knowledge and, and how he was able to, to speak into people's lives and overcome the, the lies that they had bought into. If you like that, it, he's in you also. Walk in that favor, walk in that blessing. It goes on and on in this. Uh, the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. How many times has your chemical or your computer screen or your chocolate or your, I, you know, I could go through the list, but then if I miss one, you're going to go, whew, I guess I'm out, right? <laughs> Whatever that chemical, that experience, that relationship, how many times has that enemy rise up in your face? And you've thought, well, this time I'm going to overcome it. You will not overcome it until you let the power of the cross of Jesus Christ encounter that thing. And then you get to walk in this blessing, that the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated in your face. I am no longer subject to this addiction. I am submitting my will and my strength and my future to the cross of Jesus Christ, who in his obedience conquered the curse of addiction. I am no longer going to be a slave to fear in my life when I wake up in the morning of what somebody's going to say about me. I am no longer going to live under how many thumbs up or thumbs down do I get on my Instagram post, whether I feel value in my life, because the value in my life was determined at the cross of Jesus Christ. People, yes, he had to pay a price for the curses and the brokenness in our life. Maybe that's what the piercing and, and the beating and the shame did, but he also loves you and wants the best for you. He would have hung on that. They didn't need the spikes to hang them on there. He would have hung there by love. Because you are that valuable. This is, so Deuteronomy 28 is, is not a verse to motivate you and I to behave well so we don't get in trouble by God. It's a verse, it's a passage that points to the cross that basically says, if I will receive everything that Christ has done for me. It is his obedience that leads to my obedience. How could I not follow a master like that? How could I not trust somebody like that? How could I, how could I not live a life of worship for a savior like that? And so it's, it's, the Old Testament points to something. It points to our need for a savior. And so if you're here today and you've been living under these curses and maybe you have some kind of elementary knowledge of the cross, I'll just tell you up front, you need more cross in your life. You need more of the reality of Jesus in your life, right? I mean, it's not like some magical thing. 
You know, like if you wear garlic around your neck, all the vampires will stay away. It's not like that. This cross is a reminder of Deuteronomy 28, that the curses in my life have been broken. So if I'm waking up with anxiety in the morning, I'm going to look at the obedience of Christ, where he was obedient. See, that's where some of us really fall short, right? We're like, oh, gosh, I have anxiety in my life. I shouldn't have anxiety in my life. I got, I got to start thinking about really nice things, uh, rainbows, uh, unicorns, something, because my brain is going crazy, right? Well, the problem is you're trying to conquer your own curse with your own wisdom and your own knowledge. When the Word says, focus on the obedient Christ. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That means I'm just going to, Jesus, you know what? Anxiety was dealt with at the cross. So no matter what happens to me today, I can be a person of peace. I can be a person of confidence. No matter how many likes or dislikes I get, I know you love me. I am your beloved. No matter how rough my relationship feels, I know that you have given me the gift of reconciliation and forgiveness because of what happened at the cross. I focus on Christ's obedience And then these things, these blessings begin to overtake you. Does that make sense? So I want to encourage you today, if you're here and you need more of the cross. As a matter of fact, if you're here and you realize, like, I just need, I need to come to Jesus for the first time. I need to get my life right with him. I need to give him a chance to take control. I want to receive what he did for me. That all the brokenness and bad choices, the bad choices I've made and the bad choices I've done to others or myself, that they've been paid for. And that I can leave here clean. I can leave here restored. I can leave here again, not only making peace with God, but I can leave here with the peace of God. So I'm going to have us all stand. And as I'm going to have the worship team come up, and we're just going to finish this morning with this idea. I think Regina said it so well earlier today, too, just uh, with what she shared about God's acceptance in her life. And so if you're here today and you need to get right with God, then um, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. We're going to have somebody come to you, and they're going to pray for you. This is the safest place. We do this a lot because there's a lot of us that really need God's presence in our life. And so, um, you know, there's this old thing, close your eyes, bow your head. Um, Why? If you're afraid of somebody seeing you when you raise your hand, you're probably not ready anyway. I'll tell you what, I got saved with a verse out of Romans, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God for salvation for those who believe. And I decided a long time ago, I believe. If you're here today and you want to believe that you can be set free, then today's the day to raise your hand. Some of you are here. Amen. Keep your hand up until somebody comes to you. And, you know, we're not going to do anything weird to you. Bless you. Um, That's good news. People, yeah, amen. Also, I'd like to say a prayer. If you've realized I need more revelation of the power of the cross in my own life, that I've trusted God to a level, but not all the way, that I'm still finding some curses in my life that I've got to work through. Um, if that's where you're at, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand as well, and I just want to speak a prayer over you right now. So God, for those of us who are raising our hand, we're saying... I need more of the cross in my life in some specific area. I need to experience more of the breaking of a curse or the fulfillment of a promise. So Lord, we just believe in the proclamation and demonstration of your word. So as we lift our hands and surrender, we say we receive not only the power to break curses, but we also receive the favor that you have in our lives towards promises. I bless each of you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Let's finish with the worship song. If you'd like prayer, our prayer team's also back there. Get some prayer. We'll see you next week. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to a message from the Sanctuary Church. 
For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube.